by now. Um, this is Suzanne Cameron. I want to say good afternoon and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Communications Reliability, Security, and Interoperability 7 Council, which I now open. Today we will be joined by Lisa Faust, the FCC's Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau Chief. Lisa has an update for us um, that is very important. It comes from the Chairman's Office. Um, and after Lisa um, speaks to us, Charlotte will have some, some words to say, and then Lee Thibodeau will be presenting a report, um, a report on risk to 5G from legacy vulnerabilities and best practices for mitigation. And then the rest of the working group will give us updates on their progress. Um, I now officially open the meeting. And Lisa, would you like to speak? Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the fifth meeting of Physics 7. You have been examining a host of complex technical issues over the past year in order to develop recommendations for the commission. I recognize that the past three months, when we have all been working from home and in many cases caring for loved ones, have been particularly challenging. I applaud and thank you for continuing to volunteer your time and effort to CISRIC throughout. Now for today's business. First, I would like to announce the addition of a new task for CISRIC 7, which has been given to Working Group 1 because it fits well with their expertise. The FCC is asking CISRIC 7 to recommend solutions to a technical issue that causes the public to receive some National Weather Service alerts sent over the emergency alert system more than once. These duplicate alerts can cause confusion and need to be resolved. To effectively address this issue, stakeholders from throughout the alert initiation and transmission process should have a seat at the table. To that end, we are adding additional members to Working Group 1, Joe Barry, President and CEO of the California Broadcasters Association, Clay Framewald, Chairman Washington State Emergency Communications Commission, Committee, and Harold Price, President of Sage Alerting Systems. Thank you all for agreeing to serve. Second today, you will vote on a report titled Risk to 5G from Legacy Vulnerabilities and Best Practices for Mitigation. This report was drafted by Working Group 2, which is chaired by Lee Thibodeau of Insight. In this report, Working Group 2 identifies risks to 5G from legacy vulnerabilities and recommends best practices to mitigate these risks. Working Group 2 focused on the 5G non-standalone architecture implementation, a transition phase that occurs prior to deploying the full 5G next generation core. Working Group 2 finds that most security risks associated with 4G LTE networks still apply in a 5G non-standalone architecture deployment because the deployment uses all of the 4G LTE network elements. All previous CISRIC recommendations on protecting 4G core also apply to 5G non-standalone architecture implementation. Last, I'll note that you still have a lot of hard work ahead of you with the majority of the reports due in the next 10 months. So I will close this by thanking you in advance for all of your efforts, which can benefit America's communication systems and therefore our great nation. Thank you. Hi, this is Charlotte. And first of all, good afternoon. And thank you so much, Lisa, for your comments today. As, as Lisa indicated, this is the fifth meeting, and I know we've all been working hard not only at work, but also at home, dealing with situations and, and as well as uh, ensuring our communications infrastructure can support the people of the United States and beyond. As I think many of us know, our infrastructure has, has clearly performed at an exceptional level throughout the country with unprecedented demand that came essentially overnight. I thank you for all the work that you, your companies, your family, your friends do um, to keep uh, America good from a telecommunications perspective and as your chairperson. With that, I will now take roll call. Okay, Brandon Adley. 
Mark Anus. Anus. Uh, here. Thank you, Mark. Mary Boyd. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Wade Buckner. Here. Thank you. Brian Kelly. Or Daly, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Brian Daly. Good afternoon. <laughs> I saw the case, uh, Brian, and I confused it. <laughs> no problem. Jay English. Here. Thank you. Lori Flaherty. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Lori. Craig Fugat. Robert Gessner. I'm here. Thank you. James Gorky. I'm here, Charlotte. Thank you, James. Mark Hess. Mark Hess is on. Hey, Mark. Antoine Johnson. Here. Farouk Katibi. Present. Thank you, Farouk. Chandra Katora. Jeff Littlejohn. Tim Lorello. Michelle Manley McInerney. I'm here. Thank you, Michelle. Danny McPherson, I heard you. Present. Yep. Joe Meyer. <clears throat> is that a yes, Joe? No, Mike, Michael Rapp is representing the new team level, so Joe is no longer. Okay. Could you spell your last name for me, please? Uh, Rap. R A A P. Okay. Thank you. He, he's already on the roll call. Okay. Okay. Further down. I see it. Um, Stephen Barkley for Susan Miller. Present. Thank you. Richard Perletto. Pat Roberts. Here. Hi, Pat. Jeff Hi. Robertson. Travis Russell. Present and healthy. Good. <clears throat> Francisco Sanchez. I'm on the line. Glad to hear from everybody. Hey. Dorothy Spears D. Dorothy is here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Lee Thibodeau. I'm here, Charlotte. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Brian Tropsper. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Steve Watkins. Steve Watkins is here. Thank you very much, Steve. And John Williamson. Well, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for the great attendance today. And uh, again, this will be our second virtual meeting. I think we did very well the first time. Um, and uh, Kurian and Suzanne have done um, a number of things to improve uh, the virtual format as well. Uh, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce Lee Thibodeau. And Lee will be reporting on the risk to 5G from legacy vulnerabilities and best practices for mitigation. With that, Lee, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlotte. Good afternoon. Uh, just a quick sound check. Can you hear me far okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, slide. A slide, please. Uh, working Group 2 has submitted its first report to the Council uh, a couple of weeks ago, and today the group is requesting acceptance of its report number one by the Cedric 7 Council. My role as the Working Group Chairperson is to provide the Council with a briefing on our report. Uh, next slide, please. Very quickly, our agenda for today includes first a short background on Working Group 2 with, most, with which most of you are already familiar from our earlier Working Group quarterly briefings. Second, I'd like to provide just a brief background on 5G since there may be some council members who are not fully familiar with it. And then just some notes on 5G non-standalone architecture which has been the focus of the Working Group's efforts. And finally, I'd like to walk through the Working Group's recommendations for both the FCC and the industry, closing um, by attempting to respond to any questions the council might have and then requesting acceptance of our report uh, by the council. Um, the slide, please. As we meet here today, uh, fifth generations or 5G networks are being deployed both in the US and around the world. The very design of, of 5G 
incorporates a number of existing standards from previous generations of technology. And this means that there is a potential that the vulnerabilities associated with and, and currently deployed in earlier technologies may be persistent in 5G deployments. A slide, please. The FCC has directed Working Group 2 to review the risks to 5G wireless networks that may carry over from existing vulnerabilities in earlier wireless technologies and to explore how these vulnerabilities might impact the integrity, confidentiality, and availability of wireless networks. Based on that review, the working group has been asked to recommend best practices to mitigate those vulnerabilities. A slide, please. Additionally, Working Group 2 has been asked to recommend any changes to the 3GPP SA3 standards that will help mitigate risks and to scale those changes relative to expense and risk. Finally, Working Group 2 has been asked to identify optional features in 3GPP standards that might mitigate security risks and to make recommendations in that respect. These last two objectives will be addressed more fully in Working Group 2's second report, uh, which is due in December of this year. A slide, please. This slide just gives a quick outline of our Working Group 2 deliverables. We're delivering report number one today on schedule and requesting acceptance of it by the council. And report number two, as I mentioned, is due in December, and the Working Group has already begun work on that. A slide, please. This is a list of working group two members. The working group, uh, I, I will note, put in a, a great deal of effort in production of the report. And a couple of notes before I move on. First, I'd like to recognize John Marino. John was the editor of our report and put in a lot of hours and a great deal of effort. And the working group wants to thank John and recognize him for his effort in that. And I also want to thank Curry and Jacob, uh, the working group's FCC liaison, for his support and, uh, and his guidance throughout preparation of the first report. So thank you very much. A slide, please. The working group uh, members also had the option to designate an alternate, and this alternate could act on their behalf should the member be unavailable. I want to note that alternate members have all made significant contributions to the efforts of the working group and to, into our report number one. And also note, as we talked earlier, that many working group members also had uh, COVID-related responsibilities within their respective, respective companies. And sometimes those responsibilities drew them away from the uh, work of the working group and our weekly meetings, and the alternate members stood in and did a great job. Um, there were some points along the way, actually, this spring where we were concerned that the working group might fall behind schedule in preparation uh, as a result of, of some of the COVID uh, related responsibilities that demanded time, but with a couple of extra meetings near the end, uh, the work the, the working group was able to deliver the first report on time. A uh, slide, please. Now, just a bit uh, about 5G. Fifth generation or 5G technology is, represents a very significant change in core uh, architectures. It's a shift away from the engineered systems deployed on purpose-built hardware that comprised communications networks in the past. And it shifts away from those toward a more service-based architecture that's based on commercially available, off-the-shelf hardware, and more open software than was prevalent in earlier technology deployments. Much of this um, change has been accomplished through the continuing integrations of the telecommunications industry and its tradition of reliability and security with the information systems industries focus on scalability and flexibility. A slide, please. By design, 5G architecture has been built upon basic requirements to support first multiple access technologies including wireless, wireline, and Wi-Fi as examples. As well, 5G has to support massive connectivities at very high speeds, and 5G architecture has to provide significant re reduced latency 
when compared with previous generations of networks. While 5G can support multiple access technologies, as I mentioned earlier, Working Group 2 has focused its work primarily on wireless access networks. Slide, please. The transition from 4G to 5G architecture is also unlike previous technology advancements in the telecommunications industry. For example, when operators move from 3G to 4G technology, a full replacement of core and radio networks or RANs was required. By comparison, the trans transition from 5G, I'm sorry, the transition to 5G offers an operator a migration path using 5G non-standalone architecture, or NSA, as it's referred to. Using 5G NSA, the operator can begin introducing limited 5G services by deploying 5G new radio, or NR, while still utilizing the 4G evolved packet core, or EPC switch. This allows the operator to introduce those services while preserving some of their investment in 4G RANs and extending the useful life uh, of those elements. A slide, please. It's this 5G non-standalone architecture, or NSA, on which Working Group has focused its work. I should also note here that Working Group 3 is focusing on the standalone architecture, and you'll hear from them in upcoming CISRX. A slide, please. Key attributes of a 5G non-standalone architecture are first that it introduces, I'm sorry, it utilizes the 4G LTE RAN for the control plane and signaling traffic and retains the use of the 4G Evolved Packet Core or EPC for switching. As I mentioned, it, it offers that migration path to 5G standalone while extending the useful life of certain 4G elements. Slide, please. What you see here is a very simplified drawing of the 5G non-standalone basic architecture. The drawing is perhaps a little bit dated in its use of acronyms, but, the, but you can see that the user equipment establishes a dual connectivity between the, to the 4G enode base station and the 5G new radio, or NR. Of course, uh, assuming that um, the user equipment is capable of supporting that dual connectivity. Control plane traffic is carried on the LTE RAN, while the 5G element will carry the user plane traffic. Next slide, please. Working Group 2, in, prepar in generation of its re first report, has been holding weekly conference calls since last fall. The groups also participated in several joint sessions with Working Group 3 to share information and hear presentations from subject matter experts. Along the way, the two working groups have shared information with either group uh, when either one has received or discovered information that might be of value to the opposite group. So just a quick note to, to thank Farooq Khatibi and his working group three colleagues for their help in, in sharing information uh, and, and participating in joint meetings to discuss relevant topics. The slide, please. Moving now to our recommendations. First, the recommendations of the working group for the FCC. Previous CISRIC working groups have done some very valuable work in a number of areas, including security, and we talked about that just a little bit ago in the opening of the meeting. Working group two recommends that the FCC continue to encourage industry adoption of CISRIC recommendations, as well as continue promoting the awareness of CISRIC's work. There's a lot, been a lot of very good work done already, and the working group wishes to ensure that attention continues to be paid to that work in the future. New slide, please. Second, working group two reiterates a recommendation that was first put forward from CISRIC in CISRIC six working group three, which they published in an addendum to their final report. In that addendum, Working Group 3 recommended that the FCC actively participate in supply chain risk management programs because those public-private partnerships are helping develop the framework that's needed for trusted 5G networks. 
Working Group 2 did not conduct significant or deep dive into supply chain risk management, primarily because there are a number of other uh, ongoing groups conducting this research already. So rather than re risking duplication of, that, of a great deal of that work already going on, Working Group 2 would reiterate the recommendation that the FCC continue its participation in and support of that supply chain work. Because as we mentioned, the supply, secure supply chain is going to be an important part of developing the tr trusted framework required for 5G networks. Slide, please. Working Group 2's final recommendation for the FCC concerns best practices for user plane security. The security of the user plane information is critical to the development of trusted networks. Control plane vulnerabilities can expose networks to risks such as rogue base stations, as just one example. Working Group 2 recommends that the FCC consider future CISRIC efforts that would be focused on reviewing ongoing improvements in 4G security best practices, as well as reviewing any 3G PP standard enhancements that might be focused on a user plane security. Slide, please. Turning now to the working group's recommendations for industry. Previous working, previous CISRICs, particularly CISRICs 4, 5, and 6, produced extensive research into 4G security. Because 5G's non-standalone architecture is so heavily dependent on the LTE network for signaling and for core elements, the industry can gain valuable practice, I'm sorry, valuable best practice information from the reports of some of those earlier CISRICs. Particularly noteworthy are some of the recommendations in the CISRIC 5 Working Group 10 final report regarding signaling, security, and encryption. Working Group 2 recommends that the industry rely on, rely on and review the work of some of those earlier CISRIC working groups in their efforts to mitigate threats to the 5G non-standalone environment. New slide, please. Next, Working Group 2 recommends that industry consider a device security management system for 5G networks. 5G networks are going to see not only a great deal more devices connected to networks, but there will be a great variation in the capability, sophistication, and potentially the security of those devices. For example, unlike the devices with which operators are most familiar today, 5G networks will see devices that will be in use for long periods of time without software updates. Utilization of technologies such as artificial intelligence might help operators build the systems to detect, detect malicious or misbehaving device on networks. A slide, please. The working group's report comments on the further and continuing integration of the telecommunications industry legacy of reliability and security and the information technology industry's legacy of scalability and flexibility, as we talked earlier. 5G networks, I think, are excellent examples of the intersection of these technologies. But the combination is one of the things enabling 5G development, but at the same time, it highlights the need that people coming from either of those disciplines must possess knowledge in the other discipline. In particular, New workforce training is going to be needed on technologies such as cloud architectures, network virtualization, and software-defined networking, which are some of the foundational elements to realize the real power of 5G. The working group recommends that industry establish best practices for employee training needed to address the transition to 5G. The report in CISRIC 5, working group number 7, would re we think provides some good foundational work with its recommendations for industry involvement in internships, work studies, cybersecurity uh, scholarships, and curriculum development. The next slide, please. Working Group 2's next recommendation for industry relates 
to the security of the control channel. As outlined in the report, the control plane for 5G non-standalone implementation is provided via the 4G LTE network. There are techniques in 5G new radio that can mitigate interference and thereby improve security. In section 4.2 of the working group's report, we outline the flexible transmission capabilities and the working group recommends that operators research and leverage these improvements to enhance interference mitigation. Next slide, please. As, as mentioned earlier, Working Group 2 researched several technical papers during the course of its work. Based on its review, the Working Group did not find the papers reviewed to have introduced new attack vectors and previously identified threats continue to be reviewed by industry groups. Higher layer security protections, such as at the application level, layer as one example, might be considered to help mitigate these user plane threats. The working group recommends that industry consider higher layer protections as one source to mitigate threats. The next slide, please. That concludes um, the, the review of Working Group 2's recommendation. In closing that, I just want to make a note to thank the members of Working Group 2 for their report. There was a great deal of debate and critical thought that went into the report, and every member of the Working Group and every alternate made significant contributions to the report. As a chairperson and probably the least qualified member of the Working Group, I learned a great deal from my colleagues through this work in preparation of our first report and thank them for the efforts and the education that they provided me in this. The slide, please. If council members have questions, I will attempt to, uh, to address them. Otherwise, with that, Madam Chair, the, the members of the working group would respectfully request acceptance of our report. Next slide, please. At the end of the presentation, uh, there is a glossary of acronyms that have been used in our presentation. So with that, I will close my comments and uh, attempt to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Lee. We're going to open it up for questions now. Are there any questions on the, on the phone call? With that, um, if there are no questions, I'll give it just a minute. Anybody has a question? Maybe on mute. If not, I'm going to call for a vote. All those that are aye, please say aye. 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 All those that are nay? Okay. Um, we will accept, and thank you very much for working group two. We will accept, we, we accept the CISRIC 7 working group, group two report on risk to 5G from legacy vulnerabilities and best practices for mitigation. Thank you, Lee and team. We really appreciate all your work. With that, we're going to get an update. We're going to move to the working group updates. And first um, will be Craig for working group one, which will be alert, originator, standard operating procedures. Craig, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Next slide. Um, we already got in the beginning of the briefing about the new task for working group one, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, just as a refresher, uh, we had four tasks in our first assignment. Uh, they're on the screen. Uh, next slide. Uh, probably the, the one that we have um, spent most time on is, is uh, number four. And um, I think we briefed before, but I'll, I'll cover that in more detail, that we have actually um, looked at the recall of a false alert as uh, two separate processes, one for EAS and one for wireless emergency alerts because there were some technical differences in those procedures. Next slide, please. Uh, we have completed, I think, most of the work on the items uh, that have been discussed in those assignments. And uh, we're in the process now of working on our final uh, document uh, in that draft. And uh, we continue to refine that 
uh, and we are well on our target of having that delivered uh, before this fall. Uh, we had the second task added in discussion with the group. Uh, our consensus was to continue the work that finished our first task, uh, which we will do early, and then we'll begin working on the second task. Next slide. And again, this was, uh, as we briefed earlier, uh, the condition of duplicate National Weather Service alerts uh, issued over the emergency alerting system and uh, looking at the technical process of that. Next slide. And again, this is just more of the text that was in the uh, um, Next slide. And again, it's to recommend the uh, overall best solutions to resolve the duplicate National Weather Service issue. Um, as you heard, we're having some uh, uh, new members added to the existing group. We are not anticipating dropping any of the existing members, but merely adding to that. Next slide. Uh, and as we continue to work on that, um, we'll again present our progress reports. I would imagine we'll start on this later this summer as we're finishing up our first task. Next slide. Uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, our new members will be joining the task as we begin working on the, uh, the second task we have. Next slide. And we'll actually uh, have a change out of our FCC liaisons as we change over. Uh, James Wiley has been working with us on our first task. Uh, Dave Munson will uh, uh, be working with us on the second task. Next slide. And again, our, our first report was due in uh, September. Uh, I think we're going to be done before September, probably later this summer. Uh, report two is due in March of uh, 2021. And again, we'll start that when we have pretty much our final uh, draft report to present to the, uh, the committee. Um, and uh, once we get to that point, uh, we may go ahead, well, we'll probably go ahead and start working on task two pending a, uh, a full vote of the committee on report one. Uh, next slide. I believe that was my report. Any questions? If not, I'll turn it back over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Craig. Uh, with that, we're going to turn for an update from Working Group 3, Managing Security Risks and Emerging 5G. Frog, I'm turning the mic to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next slide, please. So some background for Working Group 3, um, um, as, as uh, uh, Working Group 2 Chair uh, Lee Tebedo eloquently pointed out, uh, there's quite a bit of activity going on with respect to uh, 3GPP release 15 and 16 on security uh, for 5G, and uh, we will talk about what's the delineation between Working Group 2 and 3 in a later slide. Next slide, please. So the objective of Working Group 3 is to evaluate Release 15 and 16 standards and identify and, uh, any risks, and security risk, and uh, also develop some uh, risk mitigation strategies. Next slide, please. And also, uh, a second objective is to identify all the optional features that are in 3GPP um, specs and provide some recommendation on what would be uh, the potential uh, uh, acceptance or uh, not acceptance of those features for to make sure that the North America deployment is secure and uh, its roaming is possible um, smoothly. Next slide, please. So the first report, uh, which is ongoing, uh, is entitled Network Reliability and Security Risk Reduction, and, and that work is uh, going well, and we are almost completing that work. Next slide, please. And we have a second report on the optional features with respect to uh, what is in release 15 and 16 of 3GPP specs. Next slide, please. So we have, um, this is a list of uh, members in working group three, 
And as other uh, uh, working group chairs have said, you know, without the help of all these members, work progress would not be happening. So again, we thank them all for their participation and contribution. Next slide, please. In addition, um, they were, we had had um, a number of alternates that, uh, you know, we call them alternates, but in reality, they are fairly active and they're providing a lot of contributions. So we should really thank these alternates as well. Next slide, please. So the status, uh, we have been having biweekly calls. Um, as a matter of fact, it's really been more than biweekly calls because the weeks that we don't have calls, we often have a joint call with working group two um, on some areas. So we have been having a, a number of very productive uh, calls uh, uh, since the beginning of the CISRIC. And also, um, as always, uh, we appreciate at his help for providing um, um, the, 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 the system for us to have our contribution uploaded and calendaring and so forth. So thanks, Atis. Next slide, please. With respect to um, deliverable schedules, uh, report one is a very good shape. Uh, we, you know, honestly, we have, we, are, we can probably finish it before the end of summer. It is due September of 2020. Uh, we have a second report. We have already started on working on that. Again, second report, uh, we'll discuss about the optional features of release 15 and 16. We have had really good discussion on it. And we're going to actually have both reports going in parallel because some aspects in report one uh, reflects on report two. So we have now ongoing discussion on both reports. Next slide, please. And as uh, Working Group 2 Chair uh, Lee Tepito mentioned, uh, the focus of Working Group 2 is on NSA. The focus of our group, Working Group 3, is really on SA and 5G core. So we are really looking at options 2, 7, and 4 uh, of 3GPP. Next slide, please. And uh, the status has been that we have been working, uh, reviewing documents. We have had a lot of presentation from experts. And again, that's another aspect that we have had a lot of uh, subject matter experts uh, coming to us and presenting. Just last week, we had two of those. Um, um, and so I, we really appreciate all the effort from not only our members, but also subject matter experts who come to our group and present their findings. Next slide, please. So next step, we will continue our work, we will continue our analysis, and continue developing our baseline, um, or continue having our bi-weekly or more frequent calls, and we will continue to provide updates. Next meeting of the full CISRIC, we will actually have first report presented, so we are all excited about that. Next slide, please. With that, Madam Chair, I would like to open the floor to see if there are any questions. Ma Madam Chair, if you're speaking, you may be mute. Nope, I am not. I was just waiting to see if there was a question, Farouk. Oh. Any questions for Farouk or the team? Well, thank you very much, uh, Farouk, for the update. And uh, I know that you guys are, are driving towards uh, the September uh, presentation. So thank you for all of your work activity. Thank uh, you. Moving, al moving along, uh, we're going to hear from Working Group 4 on 911 security vulnerabilities. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary Boyd. Thank you, Madam Chair. I bet you're glad I'm not going to talk about 5G. Um, I'm going to remind the Council uh, about our mission and our background. Next uh, slide, please. Um, I'll repeat what you've heard for some time now uh, in the event we have uh, new participants on the web. Uh, you might recall that uh, 911 is in a transition uh, today from a legacy uh, architecture that's been in place for a very long time into IP-based networks. As we make that transition, uh, we end up in sort of hybrid systems and hybrid state um, as we co-mingle networks. And in that state, we oftentimes can get into um, 
data issues or security risk issues. So as identified on next slide, Jeff, thank you. Uh, the commission has asked us to identify those security risks in the uh, legacy, transitional, and then the final end state of next generation 911. Uh, identify those security risks and then recommend best practices that would mitigate uh, the risk. The, in addition to that, and, and as Farouk said, we, we have a couple of reports that are working parallel. Um, we will also look at, the, um, at, at those vulnerabilities and look at remediation expense um, to, to implement the, the uh, recommendations that we'll make. Next slide, please. Um, we did also, we were asked by the commission, uh, a reminder that we had an additional task um, added, and that was to study the interoperability of our 911 systems throughout the country. Uh, that report has been completed uh, in March and delivered to you. Next slide, please. We are now focused on report two, as I uh, summarized earlier. And um, we are in the middle of that, and I will summarize where we are in just a few moments. Next slide, please. And as I indicated, we're work parallel, uh, parallel to two, report three. Next, please. We, um, our report two schedule is to be finalized in September. Um, I'm, I'm going to remain an optimist here. Uh, you're going to see in our updates that we are, we are in the framework and actually the development of that report. So um, hopefully we will not run into any roadblocks in meeting that September deadline. The March 3rd, I mean, the report um, three is not due until March of 2020. Um, hopefully, as since we're paralleling the effort, uh, we might can complete that earlier. But if, um, if history repeats itself, TAFOPA had to look at monetizing uh, some expense on 911 uh, network elements and it became rather difficult. So I'm hoping, Charlotte, that that will not be the case here. So I'm gonna hold to the March 2021 deadline and just hope that we can complete it early. Next slide, Jeff. Um, as the other work group chairs have acknowledged, uh, this work that we are asked to do by the commission uh, would never be accomplished without the dedication of a lot of people. Um, on the slide represents the working group for membership and their alternates. Uh, the alternates are very, very active and sometimes um, alternates, you know, step in and become primary because uh, our primaries get pulled on other other projects. COVID, COVID has, um, since our, our subject matter experts are on you know, 911 uh, responsibilities for their, their agencies or their companies. We oftentimes have had them pulled uh, dealing with COVID um, or in more recent times, some of the unrest in our country. So I just wanna, I wanna acknowledge the dedication of this team. This is the, you know, this is the A team of 911 in our country. I am honored uh, to be able to partner with this team as we work on on security issues and, and minimizing those risks on our network. I wanna do just a look, I'm gonna do a shout out and it'll embarrass him. Uh, Tom Breen from Comtech uh, has been in the 911 business for a very long time. He is our scribe. He, he is the one who keeps us straight on task, um, all of our, our tracking uh, matrix. And so Tom, you, you are our guy. He helps with the editing. So thank you for being there again for us. He's been with us many times now. So thanks, Tom. Um, also to Rasul uh, with the commission. Rasul, you're always there for us. You always run to ground questions we have. So thank you for the, the support that we receive from you. Okay, next slide. Um, let's go on, Jeff. I've already talked about what our charter is on report two. So here's where we are on, on our status, Madam Chair, and to the council. Uh, we kicked off immediately after the completion of report one, um, report two. We do have our project, project plan. As I indicated, we do have a framework. Um, the drafting, I mean, we have pretty much the report in draft form. We created a sub-team um, of our working group members that actually 
have either you know full time responsibilities on on cyber uh, and specifically with public safety nine one one cyber um, issues um, or have worked it in the past. So we have a sub team of individuals who have really been uh, developing the ma- you know the major content and contributions of the report. Uh, they they then come back and work with the full working group on their contributions. Um, as part of that, we've established our timeline so we can meet the September uh, report schedule. And um, I am I am very pleased to see that it is in report uh, that it's in draft stages right now. Let's go to our next slide, Jeff, please. Um, this is just a high-level overview of our framework uh, to council members and folks who are observing on the web. Uh, there are some elements of our report that are going to be very familiar to you, uh, but in terms of just general education, uh, we'll have uh, a general uh, a section in the report that talks about the implications um, in cybersecurity considerations as you transition to next gen 911. Some of those risks uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to introduce uh, considerations in InfoSec models, you know, the different threat uh, actors and landscape and the approach and available solutions that will be out there for industry and, uh, and 911 authorities since today, you know, we see 911 authorities uh, actually driving um, and procuring the services and setting, you know, setting in place all the, the vendors for the deployment. So this will be, a, once again, a very good tool uh, for 911 authorities and public safety to use to mitigate the risk on on these systems as we migrate. Another element, um, and this is where at least everybody on council from the industry, the NIST framework that's been in place now, what, my goodness, seven, eight years, uh, tried and true. Uh, we're going to integrate that NIST framework uh, where, you know, you follow the the core principles of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover in terms of the core outcomes as you as you look at protecting those networks. Uh, it, it looks at the bad actors. You know, we have we identify who the potential bad actors are uh, for public safety so they can begin to think in the various uh, frameworks and that's available in the systems of, in public safety. So they look beyond just 911, you know, maybe other networks that are coming in. Um, the the other portion of our report uh, will be actually more detail uh, about detect, respond, and recover. And then um, as we are drafting and, and developing this report, best practice is a major element of our of our report. Not only analyzing the current best practices that are related to any cybersecurity threats, but the development of those. And council, we will develop those those uh, best practices, you know, as we go along, as we are going along in the applicable section of the report. Um, but that's sort of the where we are today. And so we'll go to the next slide. Um, our next step is um, to finalize the submission of our report in August and get that to Suzanne and the team so they can prepare it for council. Um, just a reminder, uh, we we routinely use ADIS. I'm going to do a shout out to, to ADIS again in allowing us to use their workspace. Um, that is our primary, actually it's the only tool we use. Uh, for managing the working group, our attendance, the documents, the duties, everything is archived uh, with the ADIS workspace. So thank you all for allowing us to have access to that tool. Next slide, please. And Madam Chair, that concludes working group four's overview for report number two. Can I answer any questions? Any questions on the telephone? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mary and team, for the update. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Working Group 6, Security Vulnerabilities, and Danny McPherson. Danny? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, everyone, for joining today. Uh, be really quick with this update. Not much has changed since the uh, last update we gave, but the Working Group is continuing to make progress. Uh, 
Let's go on to the next slide, please. So uh, the core working group members are here. Uh, no new working group members as you've seen, but uh, we've had some uh, steady participation on our calls and contributions from the working group members. Uh, on to the next slide, please. These are the uh, the alternates who, as as we all well know, are uh, you know very often the subject matter experts, as the previous speaker just noted, and uh, and have been providing considerable input to the working group. So we uh, we certainly uh, appreciate the uh, you know, all the organization's primary members as well as the alternates that are con contributing. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so you know, so we're, here's the meat of the presentation I'm providing today. Uh, in general, the things on the left that you're looking at are pretty much complete. We've had a large number of SME briefings. We've had some uh, more advice and continued support from Addis, as uh, as others have noted. We really appreciate them providing facilities and infrastructure to uh, to be the primary platform that enables our working group. Um, so, so we appreciate that. Um, we've made good progress on uh, on our SME briefings on all of our objectives today. Uh, the, uh, the the current primary objective for the working group now is to to add a bit more meat and make sure we capture all the feedback and uh, and um, input that we receive from working group members and from SME briefers. And then we also continue to incorporate the best practices from other organizations that address the vulnerabilities we've identified. And then certainly uh, from there is a core mission objective of the working group, make sure that we're um, identifying any gaps that exist and what recommendations we may have for that. So that's the final phase really that we're in right now is, is that last bit. Um, interestingly enough, you know, and, and I worked with Korean and Ahmad and others from the FCC as they provide their support to us. And uh, and we've seen some, you know, some obvious evolution in the working group when we get the SME briefings where we identify technologies that exist and uh, are not deployed either because of uh, vendor interoperability or provider support or operational deployment and constraint issues. And so capturing and reflecting those is, is certainly something the working group needs to do. And then some direction with that from the FCC, potentially uh, a lot of what we're looking at there, there are techniques and capabilities to be able to mitigate those things, but for one reason or another, they may not be deployed and, and, and it may be uh, practical reality and operational constraints don't make the solutions that have been architected feasible, in particular when you're dealing with uh, inter-provider or multi-vendor uh, interoperability issues and so forth. On the other hand, uh, you know, with some of these things is, you know, is the pain worth, you know, worth the investment or is the return on investment there for, uh, for adopting or deploying things have been, that have been developed. And um, so we hope to tease that out a bit. We, you know, that's, that's certainly part of what we were, uh, what we were chartered to do as a working group. And I think that's part of what the FCC and this council and the community wants to hear is, you know, where do these things exist where we need to lean in a bit more or are there operational constraints that, you know, that just sort of, uh, make it not worth the squeeze at this time, I guess, ultimately. And so, uh, so anyway, we hope to provide more of that device and, and give this council and the FCC some, some clear direction about some areas of focus that'll help, uh, help make things a little better at the end of the day as a, as a result of this work product and this council's uh, um, engagement in, in this important security topic. So on to the next slide, please. Uh, so next steps for us, of course, uh, as I've already said, is uh, continue to refine our report. Uh, we do hope to have um, in the uh, the fall meeting of, of the council a, uh, a draft version of the report for feedback and so that we can polish it up before our final deliverable in, in early 2021. And uh, we believe we're making good progress to that. Uh, I want to give a particular shout out to John Peterson of Newstar and Vlad Wollstonecroft of uh, Twilio for um, their contributions in editing today. And then uh, we've had a large number of SME briefers that have provided some great input as well. So we, we appreciate that and we'll certainly acknowledge that in, in the draft and final reports. And uh, with that, that's basically all I have for now for, uh, for the council. We're making good progress. Um, as you can see, here's a, uh, uh, a diagram that kind of illustrates our progress and where we're at. And we are right on track, uh, just got to, Got to continue to polish the document. So anyway, with that, um, last slide I believe is the next slide. Any uh, any questions from anyone before I uh, hand it back over to uh, the, to our chairman? All right. So with that, thank you very much for uh, for continued support, and I look forward to, to speaking with you all uh, again in the coming months. Thank you very much, Danny. I appreciate it. Um, last call for questions for any of the working groups. Working group one, alert originator, standard operating procedures. 
um, Working Group 3, Managing Security Risks and Emerging 5G, Working Group 4, 911 Security Vulnerabilities, or Danny, who just finished, Working Group 6, SIP Security Vulnerabilities. Any other comments? Questions? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, if, uh, you know, the next page, I uh, appreciate uh, um, flipping, the, flipping the slide. slide. Okay. I just wanted to share with folks that the next, um, you know, um, I'm sorry, can you flip ahead on the September, the date for the September meeting? 16th. Yeah, I thought there was a slide that had it, Suzanne. It's up. That slide. Oh. Up. Oh, we're still, now it's up. Okay, we had a delay, so what we were saying, sorry. So September 16, 2020, Wednesday, will be the next um, CISRIC meeting. Essentially, um, we would uh, expect that as we get closer to that date, um, we will know whether or not we'll be all virtual or we'll have the capacity for some of us to be in, in Washington, D.C., as well as having a virtual um, uh, opportunity for it as well. So, and then the December date is December 9th, and you can put that on your calendars. So, I just wanted to first thank everyone for their um, involvement today, and I did want to go back and, and um, first of all, thank Addis for all their support, because all of the working groups have been um, super effective by utilizing the Addis system. Second, I really wanted to um, you know, underscore the fact that this is, this is uh, the last several months is something like we have not seen for many, many moons in the United States of America or across the world. And essentially, um, COVID-19 first um, basically underscore, underscored the criticality of our communications infrastructure, whether it is associated with all of the different working groups alerting and elimination of duplicate alerts, making sure that we have the right alerts to people at the right time, making sure that new technologies such as 5G standalone or non-standalone are secure to protect um, users. Um, clearly, 911 is, is absolutely critical to, uh, you know, states, uh, cities, et cetera. Um, and lastly, the SIP securities. All of these areas, I believe, are even more important and more critical in this fast-changing world where secure communications is essential. Uh, we don't know how long or how this, um, this situation is going to change the way that we work and the way that we play, but, you know, we know that um, communications and all of the various forms of communications are super critical, and uh, we can see that by the usage. You know, if you look across the communications industry, in some cases, depending on time of day, you can see a 50 to 100 percent increase in volumes, whether it be for fun or whether it be for uh, work-related situations or tele you know, telemedicine, et cetera. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone on this call as well as all of your working group members for their ongoing participation and commitment. I know, um, you know, as Lee indicated and I think Mary indicated as well, a number of us are pulled in many different ways, but we've seen that um, the teams have come together to keep the ball rolling uh, from a scissor perspective. And with that, I'm going to turn it uh, over to Suzanne for any last-minute comments that she has. But again, my sincere appreciation to all. Hello. I want to thank you all again, um, in addition to Lisa and Charlotte, for all the effort you're putting in on these issues. Um, the presentations clearly show the commitment and the work that everyone's putting in. And I really appreciate it. I know this is a difficult time for a lot of people. Um, please uh, look tomorrow morning, the report um, from um, Working Group 2, the report on risks to 5G from legacy vulnerabilities and best practices for mitigation should be posted um, tomorrow morning. And um, if you have any questions or issues, please give me a call. My cell phone, um, that if you need it, is... And um, I look forward to the next meeting on September 16th. And at, with that, this meeting of CISRIC is now adjourned. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.